Hi, I'm Ben Jack. Welcome to another episode of Advanced Passion, the show where I invite a guest to evangelize me about something they are passionate about. It could be absolutely anything at all, some food, a place they like to eat, a place they like to visit on holiday, a person, a book, a movie, pretty much anything at all today i'm absolutely de yeah, delighted to be joined so excited i can't even speak properly to be joined all the way from the usa by uh, the founder of dare to share an incredible evangelistic ministry training literally millions of uh, teenagers uh, across the states and beyond in how to share their faith effectively um greg steer from dare to share greg how are you great ben thanks for letting me on the podcast glad to be here it's a delight to have you, Anne, as well. I can see behind you there, Strategically Placed, is your latest book, Unlikely Fighter, which I'm oh, about yeah. halfway through reading myself at the moment. I say reading, doing what I do with a lot. I, these books behind me are just for show. I don't read them. I, I listen. Much easier to listen to a book than read it, right? Exactly. Um, uh, and then if I come, come across a word that I can't read properly, it just at least I know how you're supposed to pronounce it right when someone says it into my ear. Um, but your book is about... It's my, and it's, my, it's, my, it's my soothing voice, too. It, it so is. They and asked you'd me, be amazed. Did you want to... They're like, do you want to get a professional? I'm like, no, this is not their story. This is my story, you know? So. Exactly. No, and it's, it's beautifully read. There's only a couple of times when I've fallen asleep while listening to the store. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, Perfect. It's beautifully read. To cure, uh, but to cure your insomnia, get a copy of Unlikely Fighter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unlikely Sleeper, the, the sequel. That's right. Um, That's right. The story is your story. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about the book and about your story, but also about this incredible ministry that you founded and, and are still involved with today, Dare to Share. What You're an evangelist. You're passionate about the gospel. Tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, I mean, I am passionate about the gospel, and I'm, I'm really passionate about teenagers reaching teenagers with the gospel and teenagers reaching teenagers with the gospel. And I just think, you know, teenagers, you know, have this vision, this idealism, this excitement, excitement, this adrenaline, these hormones. It just, I mean, all that <laughs> yeah. mixed up in a, you know, they're just, they just want to do something. They want to mm. accomplish something. And uh, I feel like, Everywhere else, I mean, people are raising the bar for teenagers, but sometimes in the church, we lower the bar. Mm. And uh, I just feel there's so much potential. Uh, every major spiritual awakening in the history of the United States, anyway, has had teenagers on the leading edge. I believe Jesus led mostly teenagers as his right. disciples. Uh, mm. If you look at Matthew 17, Peter and Jesus and the disciples go into Capernaum, but only Peter and Jesus paid the temple tax. And if you cross reference with Exodus 30, verse 14, the temple tax is only for those 20 years old and older. Right. So right. I'm reading that, right? Jesus, he, he was a youth leader with one adult sponsor and one rotten kid and no budget. Yeah. And with that <laughs> youth group, he changed the world, right? And so I just, I, I love uh, the potential of teenagers. And, yeah. you know, it, it, with social media, I mean, look at, we as a church sometimes tend to look at, well, TikTok and Instagram and all these social media channels are, you know, corrupting our, our young people. And in a lot of ways they are. But you know what? Um, you can use that weapon both ways. Satan's used it against uh, teenagers, but we can use it against Satan. I mean, TikTok evangelist, evangelist uh, Instagram, a kid can take a stand that I'm a believer in Christ and I want to invite you in. Social media can be used in a powerful way to advance the gospel. And I just love teenagers that they're, they're creative. Gen Z, especially as a, mm -hmm. this current generation of teens, super creative. And, you know, they master technology. They're digital natives. And if they can use that to advance the gospel of Christ, watch out. Watch out. Yeah. I love what you're saying there about um, that we underserving at times or setting the bar very low in the church and we're going to come on to this a little bit later in the podcast so we'll, we'll talk about it more later i want to make sure we have a little chat about the book first and just draw some of the stuff out of your story because i think that's incredibly um persuasive about the effects of god in, in, in a family dynamic and you know one of the challenges that our teenagers have is the family environment they grew up in you know they don't have yeah. control over that a lot most of the time right and can have such a big impact had a big impact in your life the family you grew up in uh, ultimately positively because of how the gospel came into that situation but I think you're right that we do often um, set the bar very low and I, I saw I can't even remember who it was now but earlier I was looking on Twitter and someone posted you know hey youth pastors your kids are studying you know algebra and history 
uh, and and science in English literature in school, I think they can handle a little bit of theology on a Sunday, right? Yeah. It's it's kind of setting yeah. that bar a bit higher and not being so afraid to 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 get serious with with some of this stuff. And and you are so passionate about teenagers, and that is the passion that we're going to be talking about today. But before we circle back around to teenagers, tell me a little bit uh, about Unlikely Fighter. How did it come about that it's now that you're writing? your story why why is it why was it not 10 years ago well it's technically a memoir so you know i'm 56 years old now and i'm like okay i think it could be time to write it but it's not about my whole life it's mm-hmm. 22 chapters the first 21 happened before i turned 16 so it's really about being raised in a family of literal fighters i mean three of my uncles were competitive bodybuilders uh the fourth one was a bouncer at the toughest bar in denver and the fifth one was a gold gloves boxer, championship boxer, judo champion, and a war hero who had wow. five bullet holes and a bayonet wound five inches long in his gut. That he not just survived, he killed the guy that gave it to him. I mean, what in the world? I was raised in a family of Rambos, right? Of, <laughs> uh, I mean, my family was just, and they were violent. So right. there was uh, the Denver Mafia nicknamed my uncles the Crazy Brothers. So when the mafia thinks your family's dysfunctional, that's not good. So my family was a hot, a hot mess. And my mom was the only girl in the group. She had these five brothers. They were all afraid of her. And uh, because she used a baseball bat. And, you know, I was a one night stand. I never knew my biological father. When um, she found out she was pregnant, she got in a car, drove from Denver to Boston. That's 2000 miles away to have an illegal abortion. Wow. Uh, and uh, changed her mind last minute, came back and had me and had so much rage that was fueled by so much shame. Mm. And so here I am, a fatherless kid in in the highest crime rate area of our city. Uh, my family has a lot to do with that crime rate. And it is in a downward spiral. And I was like young Sheldon in the hood. I was a terrified little kid. Um, I was not a tough kid. And I would just hide all the time. And um, I remember at a Christmas celebration, all my uncles are there. I'm in the corner, my aunts, my uncles, cousins. And at the very end, my uncle Dave said, I got one more present before we break for lunch. It's for little Greg. And I came over, I'm six years old. He gives me a present. And for the first time I felt noticed by my family and they'd whispered about me but they were worried about me Mm. and I open up the present and I, it's a girl's doll. Mm. And I thought it was a mistake, honestly. And I go, it's a girl's doll. And he goes, well, I figured you don't have a dad. So you like to play with dolls like a little girl. Mm. And I could hear the chuckles and I shoved it in the stomach. And I said, I ain't no girl. I walked back and all my uncles were like, do you see the temper on him? Maybe he's one of us after all. (laughs) Well, that sent me on a spiral Mm. and it sent me on a search for identity, you know, belonging, purpose, you know, those core questions that usually teenagers ask, but I was asking them at six years old. Wow. And um, so then through a radical series of events, um, God sends a preacher from the deep South who had that Southern accent, whose nickname was Yankee for whatever reason, (laughs) to the suburbs of Denver. And on a dare, he reached my toughest uncle with the gospel, went to his door, knocked on his door, shared the gospel. My uncle Jack, who dug like this, been in and out of jail his whole life, once for choking two cops unconscious at the same time. <laughs> wow. I'd never heard the gospel. This preacher is, says, does that make sense? And Uncle Jack goes, hell yeah. That was a sinner's prayer was hell yeah. He trusted Christ. Brought 250 people out to Yankees church in one month, bodybuilders, street fighters, gang members. And then all my other uncles began to fall like dominoes. And eventually, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I went to Yankees youth group where I was trained and equipped to share my faith. And the first person on my heart was my Mm mom, who had yet to put her faith in Christ. It took me three years of sharing the gospel with her. And finally, at the age of 15, I was able to lead my my own mom to Christ and disciple her. (laughs) That's probably part of the reason I'm I'm so passionate about teenagers is Yankee. He believed, I mean, we had 800 teenagers in our youth group. We only had 300 adults in our church. He believed the fastest way to reach a city was through the young people. 
And he was mm. right. Mm. He was right. If I tell pastors this, all the, if you miss youth, you miss the movement. Right. If you think revival is going to start and happen and spread through your city, just through the adults, it, you miss the movement. Yeah. You, young people spread the gospel faster um, and farther than adults. They come to Christ quicker, spread the gospel faster mm. and farther than adults. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the story of unlikely fighter. And, uh, and the last chapter is kind of a catch up chapter that, you know, what, what's happened in the years since, yeah. um, since I was a kid, you know, so it's, pre- it's pretty powerful story. It sounds made up, but it's all true. <laughs> and it's the power of the gospel. Amen. Yeah. And it swept through my family like a holy mm. tsunami. Yeah, it's amazing. And you were telling me that some, uh, maybe a slightly, not an unlikely fighter, but an unlikely reader read it recently and came to faith from reading the book. Yeah, a 94-year-old lady named Kathleen. <laughs> I talked to her on the phone last week. She came to faith and got water baptized. That's incredible. I somebody, love that. Sent, somebody sent me the video and she's got such a look of joy on her face. She Come looks on. like a you know, 13 year old girl, just, yeah, it's just so excited. So it. praise God. And we're, we're, um, you know, I'm traveling the the States and preaching at churches and mm. making the book available and every dollar and every dime goes back into dare to share to mobilize more students for the gospel. I don't take it. I don't take any of it, but we, we want to mobilize a generation with the good Come news on. of the gospel. So this is a way to get it done. Come on. So teenagers, we know you're passionate about teenagers and, um, We'll, we'll talk about like the kind of gospel impact that teenagers can have. We've touched on it a little bit already, but why do you think it is that teenagers in general can have such an impact in the world? I mean, we know that culture is driven largely by youth culture and what tends yeah. to permeate mainstream culture comes out of youth subculture and then impacts and it, it, rad- it can shift very radically. Technology is normally driven by, by youth yeah. interests and so on and so forth. What is it about young people? What is it about someone like Greta Thunberg that can get the attention and the eyes and ears of the media of the world. Why teenagers? What is this thing? Well, I think they, you know, the brains aren't fully developed yet. Um, so they have this idealism. Mm. And I, I must be a teen at heart and a teen of mind because <laughs> I don't think mine's fully developed either. They have this idealism that we can literally change the world. Yeah. And they have a vision of causes. I think they're very cause centric. Um, and I think we've failed to rebrand the Great Commission as the greatest cause. Mm. Because you talk to teens and they're passionate, Greta Thunberg, about the environment, you know, yeah. and climate change. And you get you get uh, people that are passionate uh, about stopping human trafficking or you know, eradicating poverty or, yeah. you know, digging wells for water in Africa uh, or building homes for the homeless. And what I think we need to do, and I, I've seen this with teenagers because we call the Great Commission the cause and that that it's the greatest cause for a, for a Christian and every other cause can be a subset of it. So we can we can uh, stop human trafficking uh, and stop soul trafficking because Satan is, mm. the, is the greatest trafficker in the history of humanity. We can mm. give the hungry bread and the bread of life. We can give the thirsty water and the living water. We can build a, yeah. almost a house on earth and one in heaven. We can make this earth a better place to live in. Uh, and we can prepare them for the best place to live in, which is heaven, right? We, yeah. And so all these can click together. Uh, and when they do in a teen's mind, they become unstoppable. And they they don't look at it either or mentality. They're like, let's change the world and let's save souls and let's, let's go. And the, again, that idealism, I just love. I love that in uh, young people. I really do. I love what you're talking about there about essentially the idea of redirecting the passion, because I think sometimes what can end up happening is that we can just say, no, 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 not you're wasting your time with that thing there. You need to be doing this. But what you're talking about there is quite subtle, but incredibly profound, which is actually saying that's great. And through affirmation, reimagining that good thing into the ultimate thing and the the greater thing of all, which is, uh, you know, the gospel imperative. I'll give you an example. So we hired a young lady here at Dare to Share years ago, just, I mean, very young. Um, and we asked her what her passion was, and it was, you know, to stop human trafficking. And I mm. said, well, have you ever thought about how the gospel impacts that? And she had never thought about it. And so we kind of broke it down and it got down to the fact that, yes, we need to stop human trafficking, but we need to reach 
both the prostitute um, and and the pimp, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because otherwise, it's just going to refill the gap with you know they'll recruit others, and we can multiply this out. And she began to she never got she she's still passionate to this day. She's with Dare to Share about stopping human trafficking, but she sees the power of the gospel in all of this. Uh, mm. to change. And so I think we need to just make that connection. When you look at Lazarus, uh, Lazarus, Zacchaeus, mm-hmm. Zacchaeus in Luke 19, he gets radically saved, this tax collector. He stands up at this celebration party uh, and he says, look now, Lord, I give half my possessions to feed the poor. And if I've committed any injustice, I'll pay it back four times. Well, I tell people the real key to eradicating poverty and fixing social injustice is making disciples right. who will eradicate poverty and eliminate social injustice and make more disciples who will do the same. Yeah. And so I think we got we to gotta bring those things together. And mm. uh, I think evangelicals have tended to break ways. And I, this, I was guilty of this for years until I saw the connection. I'm like, oh, these go together. Yeah. Uh, but we have to have a gospel priority in all this. Cause if you lose that, then you're just, you know, making the world a better place to go to hell from. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you have that, then you are making the world a better place and you're changing lives for now and for eternity. And right. so it's, yeah. And I think again, teenagers, they're like, Whoa, that's awesome. I want to be a part of that. Yeah. They often clue into that stuff a lot quicker than we do. And they see the links between it more effectively a lot of the time. Um, it, it, it shouldn't, but it, ama- it has amazed me over the years of, of working with teens in all sorts of different environments at how savvy they can be and the way that their brains can work on a, on a level of wisdom and savviness. Yes, they have a naivety. Yes, they're not fully formed in so many other ways. Yes, they can be infuriating in a number of ways because of that. But at the same time, there's this savviness and this wisdom to con- make connections that somehow seems to escape us as we go through life. I don't know whether we lose a step of creativity along the way. I don't know whether the pressures of life and the more knowledge that we get, it starts to squeeze other things out of our brains. But so often I've seen teenagers make connections and relations with things in life that we are missing. And hearing the profundity and the wisdom of youth can be massively transformative. How how do we as the church listen better to our young people? I think we got to, I think we got to unleash them and then we need to, we need to listen to them. So in other words, get kids on mission with the gospel and listen to what they do and be convicted by it. I mean, I remember years ago, I mean, this is like 35 years ago, I was a middle school youth leader intern and we had a youth Sunday morning, kind of a youth service. And Steve Hope, this 12 year old kid stands up and shares the story about how he'd been sharing the gospel of Christ. And you can feel the subtle conviction in the room. And he goes, matter of fact, we all go and share the gospel of Christ. And he goes, you know what? This is non-scripted. He goes, I've never actually seen any of you as adults share the gospel of Christ. And I'm wondering, shouldn't you be our leaders? And why are we leading the way? And I'm going to tell you, that went from subtle conviction, overt conviction. He wasn't trying to be obnoxious. He was just really speaking honestly. So Mm. I think giving students platforms to do that. And I think also realizing that we're coaches, Mm. not quarterbacks. I think oftentimes Mm. we're in a, you know, and coaches, not strikers, right. Uh, To use a. a (laughs) No, it's good. I think people get the the quarterback idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. 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 So, you know, oftentimes we're like, Hey, you know, bring your friends, watch me throw this touchdown pass or watch me strike this goal. As opposed to let's coach kids to do that and let's change our the way that we're thinking. Let's equip them to have those gospel conversations. And I think the adults play a key role in, in making that happen and helping them um, really share Christ well. Mm-hmm. Uh, because a kid can get excited and start preaching at their friends. You're like, oh, hold on. Uh, you want to communicate, but you don't want to yell at them. Um, mm-hmm. or maybe the kid is shy and, and we'll talk around the gospel, but never about the gospel. Well, you need to lean into that. And so I think our role becomes those of coaches, um, mm-hmm. and mentors as they, as they live it out and multiply it out. So a- adults are essential. Yeah, you know, sure. Gen Z is great, but they need, they need the older generations to help them. And the older generations need Gen Z for that creativity and idealism. So it's a two-way street. 
yeah, you touched a little bit before on the um, the kind of slightly fal false dichotomies that we make between, you know, uh, our what we kind of believe and what and what we actually do and. It's very easy for us to become placid in our in our beliefs and and looking at the passion of the young people and their fervor to go. Um, how would you like best harness that passion for the benefit of the whole church? I think we need to help them look at youth group as all week long, and when they go to school, uh, they're walking into the mission field, and <clears throat> that they you know, are in a, in a, in a, in a way federally funded missionaries um, and that they should have free access to text uh, adult leaders and mm -hmm. sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, youth leaders all week to say, Hey, my friend's a Muslim. How do I begin a gospel conversation mm -hmm. there and come back to youth group with stories? I think when you really help a student to see their life as a mission field, then youth group is no longer an hour a week. Mm. You know, it's 24 seven and you need to, you're half monk and half missionary. Mm. And as a monk, you're, you're in the word, you're praying, you're meditating, you're thinking on God's word. You got that time, your monk time with the Lord, but then you get out of the monastery and you go on mission every day when you go into your school and you walk down the hallway, those are the people God has called you to reach. You're praying for them. You're, you're, you know, my old youth leader, Timo Sanchez did something for me when I was 12 years old. He said, I want you to go to a shopping mall on a Friday night. I want you to go to the busiest part of the mall. I want you to sit there and I want you to watch people for 30 minutes. And I want you to put an imaginary tag on their forehead bound for hell. Mm. And he goes, I want you to think about the hell they're headed to and the hell they're going through apart from Christ. Well, I'd read about the hell they're headed to. And I knew about the hell they were going through because I was raised in kind of a living hell myself. You know, mm. I watched for 30 minutes. It was weird at first, but within 30 minutes, I was crying my eyes out and I left that mall different. I had a new set of glasses on. I think we need to help our teenagers see their friends with those glasses and have a broken heart for them and pray for them and care for them and share the gospel out loud with words in a loving, relational, but bold way. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I just think I think we do that. And all of a sudden, all bets are off. We're seeing youth leaders across the nation, actually around the world, get a hold of this. And it is a game changer because church is no longer just church. It's a huddle for the real game. And we we play the game every day of the week. We're out on mission with Jesus. And we come back and we share stories and ask questions. And they come back hungry and thirsty like i tell people i was like if you have a sponge right and you have milk and you pour milk in that sponge what happens to the milk if you don't squeeze it out it spoils it rots mm. well our answer in western christianity is well we need better quality milk and is uh, our students need to absorb more of the truth and theology well yeah but if they're not ringing it out to their friends through evangelism and discipleship they rot they spoil mm. So we need to take it in and have them squeeze it out. Then they come back more thirsty. Hey, why do we believe in the Trinity? Why do we believe the Bible's inspired? How do we know Jesus is the only way? They start asking you questions about theology and all this stuff. And in the nature of evangelism makes them spirit dependent because it scares mm. the crud out of them. They're mm. like, Lord, help me. Fill me with your spirit. And we know that the key to spiritual growth of John 15 is staying connected to the vine. Well, there's nothing like evangelism to make you connect to the vine. And that's where the spiritual fruit comes from. Mm -hmm. And so at all of our Dare to Share events, we do, we do five things. Why, what, how, now, wow. Why should I share the gospel? What is the gospel? We give gospel fluency. So why is inspiration? What is information? How is, is application? How do I bring it up? How do I use the Life in Six Words app? How do I you know, deal with problems? Now is activation. So we actually have them either call a friend right there in the room or text a friend, or we go out to share the gospel. And then wow is celebration. Let's come mm. back and share stories of what God did. Yeah. Those five things, why, what, how, now, wow, you get, you get, you get teenagers jacked like boom.
like Ben Jack, boom, right? They're ready to go, <laughs> ready to rock, ready to like, let's do this every day. And you yeah. gotta, then the, then you got to create a context where that's normal, normalized, not just an event, but it's right. Movement. That's what we call, we call it gospel advancing. Mm-hmm. So gospel advancing is a philosophy of youth ministry that's built on seven values that create this ongoing momentum for evangelism every single day. And I, yeah. I don't think it's just for youth groups. I think it's churchwide. And it's all on our website, dare to share.org. If people are in for, you know, I wrote a book called Gospelize Your Youth Ministry based on those values that you can download for free on our website, dare to share.org. So dare the number two share.org. So anyway, just to, yeah. Sorry, I kind of been commandeering the conversation. It's good. It's good. We, I love it's it. And we'll, up, we'll put, We'll put links to this. It's because you're drinking all that uh, that fizzy drink there. That's got you juiced. Yeah, Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew. That's right. Yeah. I don't think you can even get Mountain Dew in the UK anymore. You used to be able to get it. Maybe you can. I don't know. Um, but we'll put links to the to the Dare to Share website in the description below. And I would encourage you to go and download that book because who doesn't want free stuff? But even better than free stuff is free, good, gospel-centered biblically faithful content that's come from years and years of experience of gleaning this wisdom uh, and testing it out and seeing it actually work in the wild. A um, couple of things I want to talk about. Hold like, on just I, real quick. Just yeah, please do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not gospel centered. It's gospel advancing. Gospel I always advancing. say that because again, yes. we're not just here to exegete it. We're here to execute it. We're, we're here to, you know, break it down and then take it out. So get it out. Yeah. Come on. A um, couple of things I want to talk about, like the, I know you're super passionate about making sure that prayer is an absolute bedrock of, of what we're doing with our evangelism. It's the it's the powerful for us going and we can't save anybody. Only God can. And all this uh, important reality that we need to make sure that we're um, living in and living out um, alongside prayer and alongside that kind of monk stuff that you were talking about to activate us for mission. I thought what you said was really interesting about the as people go from the place of prayer to the place of mission, they're also then coming back to the place of the word. And one challenge I think we probably all have with our young people, um, whether you're a parent or a youth worker or whoever else is, how are we effectively uh, getting our young people engaging with the word? Are you finding that the best way often to get young people engaging with the word so that they're in that place of monk ship if that's a word it's not a word um that they're in that place of being uh, in that kind of monk vibe in prayer but also in the word is that most successfully done out of the fact that they they kind of desperately need to get connected into the word because they're kind of on the front lines is that what you're seeing i do think it, it does definitely help um you've thrown new words monkery monk ship monk vibe i want to write well, yeah i want to write a book just... called monk vibe Great. I, just want I mean, to let's that. just use monk yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. 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 I, I do think, you know, it's kind of this, I think it's a philosophy of deep and wide. So we go deep into mm. the word as we go wide into the world. And one of the things I appreciate when I was a teenager, when you got saved at this youth ministry, they're like, here's the Bible, here's a gospel track, and we're going to teach you to study scripture and share the gospel at the same time. So You know, I've used this illustration, you know, in the United States with youth leaders that if I were to um, tell you that you have to sit, I've talked to your pastors, and if you want to keep your job, you have to sit through a 12 hour a day bomb diffusing class for eight weeks. You don't have to pass it, but you have to sit through it. How many guys would lose interest after the first class and all the hands go up? I go, what if I told you at the end of eight weeks, we're going to get on a plane and fly to Afghanistan and defuse bombs with the United States Army Mm -hmm. in the hurt locker? How many guys would be paying attention? Everybody's paying attention. We pay attention to the manual more when we're on mission Mm -hmm. because we know we're going to be out in the field. And so I do think they do go together uh, and we tend to separate those out. And mm. I think theology is meant not just, again, to be ex- exegeted. It's meant to be, you know, executed. And if you look in Matthew 28, it doesn't say teaching them everything I've taught you. It says teaching them to obey. Yeah. yeah. And so when and that obedience, not just an evangelism, but on every level, creates more thirst for the word. Yeah. 
Absolutely. The other thing with young people, of course, is the relationship between young people, teenagers and technology is um, is very clear. And you have been working on, on this app, um, Life in Six Words, and put a lot of time, a lot of investment into this to engage teenagers, both at the point of using it as a gospel resource, but also for those who are gospelizing as well. Talk, talk to me about that. How did that come about and how, what, what fruit you seeing from it? So you, 10 years ago, we did a video called Life in Six Words. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but uh, propaganda, spoken yeah. word artist goes through. So we did that, produced that video for a Dare to Share event, put it out online. It blew up millions of hits and all that mm. stuff. We said that's kind of something about life in six words. God, our sins, paying everyone life, gospel, there's something there. And we thought, what if it was an app where they chose the, how they would describe their life in six words? And so- we tested it out uh, and we had 14 words that people would choose from. So if you were to describe your life in six words out of these, what would they be? And what we found is that friends and complete strangers were like enamored by choosing their words. And then you say, tell me why you chose those words. Mm. And people would just open up. Some people break down in tears. Some people just tell you their whole life story. Some give mm. you a quick summation. But now you're in a conversation. So we added something to it. Well, we put our, we, you can program as the, as the believer, your six words in beforehand. Say, can I share with you my six words? Mm -hmm. Well, then we found that's a way to share the testimony, your, your personal story of how you came to Jesus. And it's an easy spiritual segue. And then the last part is, can I share with you God's six words? And then that's when you go through the gospel. God, our sins, paying everyone life. God created us to be with them. You just basically, and what we found is, a teenager's most common, uh, you know, kind of stance is not this face to face. It's kind of showing somebody the video, the TikTok, right, right, right. The yeah. And so they're used to showing their friends their phones, and so literally they swipe through the gospel, and at the end they sit, there's a point that says, "Does that make sense? You know, is there anything holding you back from trusting in Jesus right now?" And you can literally lead them through a prayer on the app. It'd be cool if water came out and baptized them, but that we're not there at the <laughs> technology point yet. But, um, and it's, so what's also cool, there's a world icon on the Life in Six Words app. You push it and 13 different languages pop up. So we've been working with indigenous people in different countries that are solid believers wow. that are helping us translate uh, a, an addition like uh, the gospel, but maybe in Spanish, the word is Christo. In German, the word is faith. In French, the word is hope because there's six, mm. six letters, you know, and, and um, it's been a very effective way. You know, Ben, I've used it hundreds of times. I've never been turned down, to Come engage, on. Wow. which is really weird yeah. for an evangelism tactic. It just, yeah. it just works. And so, it, yeah, it's free. A life in six words. We've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars and are continuing to invest to add languages and expand the technology and and you can put the names of the people you're praying for in the app uh, to reach. You can create face sharing groups in the app to keep each other accountable. So a group of friends on campus or a small group or a Bible study or a youth group. Uh, we, we're a, a, as the Dare to Share staff, there's like 25 of us on our Dare to Share group that we keep each other accountable. There's no leaderboard, so it doesn't get weird. But, you know, hey, Joe just shared Christ or Debbie just prayed for somebody or Jason, you know, just had a gospel conversation. Mm, yeah. And cool. you can pray for each other. Encourage. So life in six words, free on the App Store, Google Play. Just go there, download it, and share away. If you can swipe and read, you can share the gospel. Amen. Swipe and read. That's the only criterion. Can you swipe and read? Then you're qualified to share the gospel. <laughs> Um, it gets me excited when I think about technology, I think about what you've done. And I, I do hope people will go and check out the app. Um, again, we'll put the links in the description below. But um, it does get me excited to think about, you know, we're, we're taking baby steps into technology and we've inherited all of this technology. But, but, you know, our young people, our teenagers, they've grown up with it. You used the phrase earlier, digital natives. They understand it better than we will. They, they're probably already dreaming of ways to use it better than we ever will. And I kind of think, man, if we can get these uh, young people motivated in the next 10 years to become the tech leaders, who knows what they'll be able to do. But irrespective of what happens in the future, there are amazing things out there, aren't there, right now that people can engage with news. Oh, yeah. And just use, I mean, you know, there's a great story in the Old Testament about Benaiah, who is David's bodyguard, 
who goes up to a seven foot Egyptian armed with nothing but a club and the Egyptians got a big old spear. Well, he takes the guy's club away and he, I mean, the spear away. Benaiah takes the Egyptian spear away and stabs him with his own spear. I think that's what we need to do with Satan. We look at Satan with technology as a mm. giant spear. I'm like, well, let's take it away from him, stab him with his own spear, right? Let's mm. advance the gospel with this thing. Yeah. And uh, teenagers will do that We're way quicker if we just give them permission. You know, as my buddy uh, Gerard Gunner says, they, 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 don't need, they don't need purpose. They just need permission. Right. You know, come on. That's really so good. Let's, yeah. un, let's unleash them. Yeah. So let's finish on that thought then. Um, what are your kind of top tips to help us extend permission um, to, to these young people? Well, I think we need to give them gospel urgency. We need to really inspire them. That's mm. the strategic importance of sharing the gospel, you know, and we got a lot of motivations in scripture. Uh, obedience to the Lord, you know, compassion for the lost, the reality of hell. I mean, you can go on and on and on. I need to help these students understand. I had a youth, speaking of hell, I know it's not a popular subject and everybody's like, well, we, you know, we, these kids have too much fire and brimstone. I go, which kids? Which kids have fire and brimstone? Wh- which, which teenagers have had fire and brimstone crammed down their mouths? Not, maybe our grandparents did, but not these kids. I had a teenager come up to me and go, why did my youth leader never talk to me about hell? I never mm. realized my friends are going to go to hell without Christ. Gen Z Christian teens often are aware of what heaven is going to be like and hell is going to be like. I think we got to dust off some of those old great doctrines. You know, Spurgeon once said the key to great preaching is great subjects. Mm. We got some of our greatest subjects we keep hidden under the table. I'm like, let's bust that stuff out, right? And um, and really create that urgency. Then we gospel fluency. Can they articulate the gospel? That's why we use a gospel acrostic. It's not because we like acrostics. It, we have them memorize it to create gospel fluency so they know mm. what in the world they're talking about. And then gospel strategy. You need to give them a way to articulate that message. And, it, you know, you could use a life in six words app or other methodologies. I, I tell people I don't go into a steak restaurant for the plate. I go for the steak. Mm. Right? But I want it served on a plate. Well, the gospel is the steak, whatever plate, whatever methodology we use, pick a plate, serve the steak and let's rock. Mm-hmm. Come on, man. So good. Greg, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with us, um, sharing us about sharing with us about your passion for teenagers and your even greater passion for the gospel and putting those things together and coming up with some incredible hope for the world. Um, we will put links to the, in the description below to all of the things that we've talked about today. So do go check out. The Dare to Share, download the free resources, go and get the new book, Unlikely Fighter. I do recommend the uh, the dulcetly toned reading of Greg in the audiobook uh, version if you are at all uh, wanting to either A, be inspired as to what God can do in a life or through the dulcet tones, you want a good way of just drifting into sleep at the end of a exactly. long, hard day. It's, I mean, it's a win Calm either way, voice. right? It's a win, it's a win either, either way. way. Um, put it on right. put it on triple speed and reenact um, your your favorite memories of the chipmunks. It's a win-win, whichever way you go with it, right? <laughs> so do download the book and get hold of the app uh, as well. Greg, thanks so much for lending us your um, your time and your experience, your passion for young people. And um, bless you, man. For those of you who are uh, tuning in afresh today, if you haven't already checked out Greg's One Thing podcast, uh, please do that. He talks... Uh, about prayer and why prayer is the thing probably above all others that he wished he knew or the power of prayer when he first started sharing his faith Um, do go check out that short episode from earlier this week we will be back of course next week with another guest don't forget to uh, like the video apparently that helps i am not young enough to know how all of this stuff works but i am young enough to know that it does work so uh go and like the video and it works apparently subscribe uh share it comment ask questions below do whatever you want we love to engage with you so uh, please do stay in touch with us and we will catch you next time Bye.